Greetings, everyone. 大家好 I am Jaime Flores. I'm a journalist and a China watcher. I've lived and worked in China for nearly 50 years. I worked as Time Magazine's Beijing reporter for 16 years, in the 1980s through the year 2000. Later, I served as CNN's Beijing correspondent and bureau chief for 14 years, until 2015. I retired as a journalist five years ago, and now I teach at the School of Journalism and Communication at Peking University. As a Beijing foreign correspondent, I have covered a range of stories, big and small. I covered breaking news, and I did features as well. I reported live in various locations, say in Hunan Province in the early 2000s when there was a massive flooding. I was in Guangdong in 2003, reporting on the SARS epidemic, and years later in Wuhan. Covering the bird flu epidemic, I was in Sichuan too, covering the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. So I look back at the time, at my time as a journalist, with much pride and a bit of nostalgia. We now live in a dangerous time. A deadly pandemic is spreading across the globe. The, the COVID-19 virus has infected over. A million patients and has killed tens of thousands more. The big picture looks bad. The pandemic is shutting down industries, shutting down markets, and slowing down the global economy. Shops, factories, banks, and airlines—they all face bankruptcy. Millions are losing jobs, and the way we live our daily lives today is being changed abruptly. And this disruption could go on for months. It's the worst time to be a journalist. And why do I say that? This is the worst time because if you're a journalist working in China, in the U.S., the Philippines, or in Italy, Spain, or France. In all these places badly hit by the pandemic, working in the front line may put them in harm's way. Literally, I know what it's like. I covered the SARS epidemic in China in 2003. I reported from Foshan in Guangdong Province. Foshan was the petri dish of the SARS virus. Guangdong Province. Was the epicenter of the deadly epidemic. It was a difficult and dangerous assignment. Now this time we are faced with the coronavirus pandemic. We are fighting a war against an invisible and deadly enemy. This is a massive story that we have not seen in a long, long time. It's a huge story, and that's why I say. This is the best time to be a journalist. It's a good opportunity for journalists to show why the media is so important in our lives, wherever we may be. As we fight this coronavirus, media reporters are now playing an important role in informing the public and in holding public officials accountable. Now, this short presentation offers a general overview of journalism's distinct role in times of pandemic and disaster. We'll talk about the importance of timely, truthful reporting. I'll tell you about what journalists usually do when news teams go out to cover breaking news. We'll also talk about the importance of news literacy, the need for the public. You and me, to be vigilant against fake news, and to be smart consumers of news. So, what is the role of journalists? I've heard various ways to describe the role of journalists. One is journalists are storytellers. They tell us what happened, who, what, where, when, and why. 
journalists are recorders of history. Their stories often serve as the first draft of history. Journalists are whistleblowers, watchdogs, who expose wrongdoings like crimes, corruption, cover-ups. They alert the public to these problems and prompt them into action. And this is my favorite, an archaic version. Journalists comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. What does that mean? Journalists, on the one hand, comf comfort the poor, the marginalized, the victims of wrongdoings, the underdogs. On the other hand, journalists make criminals and wrongdoers uncomfortable. They make them sweat, they make them tremble in fear by naming and shaming them or by helping bring them to justice. That's how noble the journalist profession is, especially in times of crisis. The pandemic is now causing fear across the globe. Millions of people are on lockdown, travel is restricted, and markets are in turmoil. In this uneasy time, we have witnessed the media at its best. Journalists have helped inform the public promptly and extensively. They are critical players now in crisis management and in crisis communications. Me media groups, for example, use various platforms to carry regular press briefings, sometimes live through live streaming. Now these press briefings provide updates on the epidemic and give officials and medical experts a chance to answer journalists' questions and also to communicate with the public. They help serve, inform the public, and reassure the public that authorities are in control and they're doing what needs to be done, that the crisis can be overcome and that this too shall pass. Journalists help alert the public, inform them of how the virus spreads and how to avoid it. They use science and rely on medical experts' advice to give tips on, say, how we, the public, can protect ourselves. These are what we call news you can use. Just as important, journalists give a voice, a platform, to whistleblowers anywhere they may be, like Dr. Li Wenliang in Wuhan, China and Captain Brett Cozier, the commander of the U.S. aircraft carrier. The two whistleblowers faced severe punishment for warning about virus in in infections in their organizations. Dr. Lee died working in the front line and Captain Cozier was dismissed. But the two are praised as heroes for blowing the whistle and prompting action. Now, journalists around the world are working 24 seven, covering the story from different angles. They produce heart-rending stories of patients suffering and dying. They do inspiring stories of medical workers risking their lives in the front line. Many media channels air uplifting video clips of resilient people coping with the epidemic, like those videos you must have seen of uh, quarantine residents singing songs or playing the violin from their balcony or clapping their hands to inspire each other. They're quite inspiring. They also produce heartwarming stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary deeds, showing human kindness, helping each other. They show businesses and corporations, big and small, making donations, pitching in toward the common efforts to stop the pandemic. Now, all these reports help boost public optimism and encourage public cooperation. Similarly, brave and intrepid journalists have done investigative reports like exposés of wrongdoings, of bureaucratic failures, or sheer lack of government action, bad deeds that endanger the public. 
Some stories, for example, show shortage of medical equipment or protective gears in some hospitals, exposing medical workers to infection and death. Many reporters are also doing fact checking, like the short television segments I've seen um, that distinguish myths from facts. Journalists are people's advocate, and that's a nice sounding title, but with that comes the responsibility to be truthful, fair, and balanced. It's not easy. Journalists face censorship, harassment, public criticism, or even death threats, simply for doing their jobs. It's even harder now because new technology is changing the way journalism is done. New technology is also changing the way news is disseminated and consumed. Thanks to internet and the smartphones and now the 5G, workers can now deliver the news quickly and cheaply on Facebook, Twitter, WeChat, TikTok, YouTube, and many other platforms. Now everyone can be a journalist. Virtually all of us, you and me, we can be reporters and news gatherers. It's no longer remarkable that you and I can take pictures and shoot videos using a smartphone and then beam them across the world instantly and share them with our friends and the general public. Many such amateur videos, video clips have turned viral, sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. Even the mainstream media nowadays, they like to use uh, raw amateur video because they are popular or simply because they're uniquely entertaining. Surely the internet, the social media, and the other technological innovations have delivered huge benefits for end users like you and me. News and information can now be shared more quickly, widely, and cheaply. For not much money, one can open an account, build a website, and start a blog or a podcast. Successful ones gather thousands or millions of followers, and some have even made money out of that. But some of these apps have become really useful in times of emergencies and disasters. Facebook's locator feature, for example, is useful in accounting for people's whereabouts. That is to say, to tell your friends that you are safe when terror attacks or disasters happen in your location. Now these technologies, these new technology and applications are helping break the state's monopoly on truth. They also help challenge traditional narratives, traditional beliefs by offering diverse sources of information and dissenting points of view. They help curb disinformation and propaganda. Now this of course is prompting censorship and pushback. And that's why we see push and pull by conflicting sides. In any case, when censorship is breached, officials are compelled to be on their toes, to behave and to live up to their responsibilities. Otherwise, they get exposed by the media and they get into big trouble. Some officials, for example, were dismissed from office for their dereliction of duties, for poor performance during, say, the SARS epidemic in 2003 and in this epidemic outbreak in Wuhan. Clearly, the new media benefit the public. However, they bring along bad influences too, such as the virus of fake news. To be sure, many news providers, the mainstream media, the bloggers, 
your friends in the social media, they all play a positive role in informing us. But some may have a hidden agenda or an extra grind. Some may have a bias or a preconceived point of view. Others may be peddling a hoax. And that's why we must beware of fake news. Of course, we all stand for freedom of speech and freedom of information. They are hugely important in our lives and we must fight for them. They must be protected. But there is a huge legal difference between a whistleblower, someone who exposes a wrongdoing, and a criminal who say, maliciously shouts fire inside a movie house, intentionally causing panic and death. There is a fundamental difference between a whistleblower and a crook who is selling lies and peddling propaganda. So we must fight fake news when we see them. Problem is, some studies show fake news spreads faster than truth, especially online. An MIT study, for instance, looked at a decade of tweets and finds that fake news spread faster, farther, deeper, and wider than truth. So why is that? There's still little empirical data to be able to explain why, and more studies still need to be made. But meantime, it does seem that people do spread false news faster than truth because, some experts say, it's just human nature. Fake news spread partly because there is not enough fact-checking. Over the years, we've seen a decline of the traditional media, which, is, which used to provide news that people can trust. Some of them have closed down, some were bought and merged, and others have cut back on their staff due to declining revenues and profit. The result is, nowadays, there is an utter lack of rigorous fact-checking, especially in the social media. Every day, we, the consumers, are bombarded by news and information but mixed with gossips and rumors and opinions coming from all sorts of sources. And the problem is, some people choose to get them only in small doses from small media sources. And even worse, some of us are not smart consumers. Some blindly believe that everything, anything in the social media are true. If it's on the internet, they believe, it must be true. Sorry, but please do not ever believe that it must be true simply because they are on the internet. There are many examples of fake news on social media. There are many wild rumors and conspiracy theories, and you can find them. I have a long list of them exposed and challenged and negated in various apps like Snopes, factcheck.org, hoax slayer, and about.com. That's why we must be discriminating in the way we consume the news. And that's why we advise people seek a healthy, balanced news diet. Go to a wide source of credible news and information. Tencent said recently that in one month alone, last year, the media giant deleted 85,000 rumor-mongering articles and punished 7,000 accounts for allegedly violating regulations that are meant to, quote, maintain a healthy internet environment. Well, I think it's problematic that social media, like, social media platforms like Tencent and Facebook are now acting like editorial watchdogs, instead of being mere neutral media platforms, which they claim to be. 
So now they are deciding for us what we can read and what we cannot. That prompts questions like who or what institution should be empowered to allow or disallow dubious information. But that's another controversial complex topic that can be discussed in another session and another forum. Meantime, it is a a worrisome fact that the internet is indeed being used for evil purposes. Criminals all over the world use the internet's various platforms to say, launder money, push illegal gambling, pornography, prostitution, phishing scams, and and other crimes. Even the ISIS and other terror groups are said to have used the internet to communicate and coordinate activities or to spread propaganda. There are many other reasons why we need news literacy. Recent changes in the media landscape have distorted the media's motives and role. Some new media organizations, for example, are now putting more importance on the number of clicks on their stories rather than on the accuracy and the quality of their stories. There are, they are more obsessed now driving up Uh, page view traffic, and advertising revenues. And this has given way to what we call clickbaits. It's an editorial trick to write sensational or intriguing headlines that are meant to attract eyeballs. That is, to make you and me click on, on their stories. Now, clickbaits are now common because advertising, advertising money is linked to the quantifiable number of clicks that stories attract. Now, these are, there are extreme cases. In some media groups, for example, reporters and editors are paid and promoted based on page view traffic that their stories drive and not based on the news value that their stories make. Now, that is really sad. It is therefore important that we maintain a balanced and healthy news diet. Now, what does that mean? Well, just as we aim to have a balanced daily diet of food, a good mix of protein, carbohydrates, and vegetables, for example, we should also seek to have a good daily intake of information, information coming from diverse and credible sources. And that's what we call news diet. And that's why we are advocating news literacy. So we can all become smart consumers of news. So how does that work? Let's say you try to create an inbox with a mix of politics, economics, sports, entertainment, or a mix of international, regional, and local news, or a mix of straight hard news, features, opinion, and analysis. You can put together your own set of menu for your daily news diet. The common goal is to consume a balanced news diet. Otherwise, we may get locked down, quarantined, in what is called the echo chamber. What happens, say, when we rely on just one source, when we listen only to friends who share our views and to no one else? This can lead to a clustering of like-minded individuals who think and speak the same way, and sooner or later, they form what we call echo chambers. In it, they only hear their own voice, bouncing round and round. And in the long run, they start to believe only what they think because it's the only voice they hear. It's like in breeding. It's scary. It's crazy. So let's be careful. 
Let us keep our eyes and ears open to other points of view, even to views that we may disagree with. We could be wrong sometimes. We now live in a world where information is plentiful and understanding too little. There is so much void out there, and it's one of the journalist's role to fill the void. We must rely on journalists, not just to recite facts, but to help us make sense of our times. Not just to tell us what, where, when, but why, or why not? What do they mean? Why should we care? Let us turn to credible news media sources, sources which have no agenda but to report and illuminate the news truthfully and fearlessly. The coronavirus is deadly. SARS killed thousands of people 17 years ago. The COVID-19 virus has killed tens of thousands already. Virus is deadly, but fake news is also deadly. They kill too. Rumors can cause fear and fear could trigger public hysteria, panic, which could then lead to social and economic disruption, poverty, hunger, even deaths. I wonder if you've heard this one story, a tale. One day, the story goes, a man saw the angel of death walk into his town. He got scared, of course, but he mustered enough courage and asked the angel of death, why are you here? Oh, I'm going to kill 10,000 people today, the angel of death answered. Terrified, the man dashed off and ran around town, telling people, I just saw the angel of death. He said, 10,000 people will die today. But when nighttime came, 70,000 people died. So the next day, the man saw the angel of death about to leave town. Hey, wait, he shouted. You said you were only going to kill 10,000 people, but 70,000 people died that night, last night. The angel of death shook his head. I killed only 10,000, he said. Worry and fear killed the others. It's an instructive tale. It tells us that fear could be as deadly as the virus itself. And that's why we need good journalism. That's why we give credit to journalists who cover the news tenaciously, fearlessly. They are heroes too. Now, working as a correspondent may sound glamorous and fun, and of course it is. But on the other hand, it's also very dangerous and exhausting. It requires a lot of hard work, resilience, and smarts. So you may ask, how does a journalist prepare to cover breaking news, like the COVID-19 pandemic? To be honest, there is no way a journalist can truly prepare for such a huge complex story like this one. It demands so much in terms of broad knowledge, of having reliable sources on the ground, and connecting with say medical experts around the world to pick their brain and get your answers. It demands a good nose for news and sharp eyes for poignant moving stories, stories of people. It demands teamwork. It requires resourcefulness. On top of the basic skills that journalists are expected to have, like good writing skills, analytical skills, and communication skills, big stories like this also requires physical and mental toughness. One has to be fearless. In my 30-year career as a journalist, I've done both print and TV reporting. 
Of course, the ways of reporting for print media and for television are similar. There are many similarities. Put simply, you just need to be well prepared all the time. And preparation means research, research, and research. That means reading up on the subject and talking to experts. That means uh, thinking up good questions to ask, places to visit, and people to interview. Now it's a bit easier if you're reporting for print media. You may do the work with only a pen and a notebook, or just a smartphone and a laptop. If you need to blog as well, then you may need a camera or a smartphone to take digital photos and videos. And you can do that as a one-man band, or you may partner with a photojournalist. Now, it's a bit dif different and more complicated if you are reporting for television, as I did years ago. At CNN, we spoke of grab bags. For the camera crew, their grab bags contain the cameras, tripods, batteries, microphones, lighting gears, and laptops. Now, my grab bag is smaller. I kept my laptop, my smartphone, and a battery charger. Oh, I guess I'm an old school. I also carried a notebook and a pen. Now, our grab bags are always on standby, sitting next to our desks. We, we just grab them on our way out of the door whenever we had to leave hastily to cover breaking news. When covering breaking news for TV, my team used to share a to-do list, a, a checklist. And here are some that I remember. One, research and plan well. Make a list of sources, contacts, story ideas. Secure, of course, plane tickets, hotel rooms, and local fixers. People who know the place and who can, you can hire as guides. Number two, bring enough cash, bring some food and water. And sometimes you, we also had to bring tents and portable generators, like after the Sichuan earthquake and there was no housing and electricity. Number three, when covering a story, always think pictures, sound, and text. And that's the totality of a TV package. Number four, work as a team. Uh, keep your home desk informed while you're out in the field to let them know where you are and that you are safe. Number five, always get a wide establishing shot. Now that's TV speak, which refers to video shots to show viewers where you are and that's your dateline. Number six, while you are out in the field, think of the sound bites, the raw sounds, and the pictures that you may use. Number seven, whenever possible, while on location, shoot what we call in TV speak, stand-ups. Others call it piece to camera, with the reporter saying a few lines on camera to one, show your viewers that you are on the scene, and two, to explain something interesting or important that does not have pictures, except your face. Number eight, write your script. That is the narration of words over pictures whenever there is a lull or a spare time in the field. You can do that while, say, riding the car or in the taxi on your way back from an interview or a shoot. Now, doing that will give you a head start especially when you are working under a tight deadline. Number nine, show empathy while doing your reporting and interviews. Be nice. Show empathy in your stories. Number 10, view your edited story before you transmit, before you send them, to make sure there are no sloppy mistakes. And number 11, the last and most important, 
always think of the safety of your crew. Wherever we go, whatever stories we are covering, we always remind everyone, safety first. There is no story worth dying for. And so join me in wishing all the journalists covering the stories like the COVID-19 pandemic, wherever they are, let's wish them even more success. Let's hope that they stay healthy, stay safe, and stay well. And I wish you all the best in your studies. Jaime Flor Cruz, Peking University, Beijing.